Atheist Nomads episode 276, God's Wife. Really? The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin, a former ministerial candidate with a degree in theology and uh, been podcasting for six and a half years now. <laughs> Nerd. And uh, <laughs> joining me is my lovely wife, Lauren. Who has a uh, born and raised atheist and the bearer of his spawn. Yep. And we have award-winning local comedian <laughs> and survivor of crazy batshit Pentecostalism, Mikey Pullman. Hey guys, how's it going? It's going good. I'd just like to note that today we are going to be talking about divine hoo-ha, so that is excellent. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to talk Super. about... We're gonna, Super pussy. We're gonna, yes. <laughs> should be the title pussy of this episode. Pussy on the pedestal. <laughs> I think that'd get us kicked out of iTunes. Pussy mm, on the Your naming altar. conventions are so conventional. Yep, yep. But we're going to talk about God's wife. We're going to talk about some of the responses to the Tree of Life synagogue shooting. They're cover a few Jews. regional stories. And cover the latest on blasphemy around the world. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. Throughout the Old Testament, especially the older books, God is sometimes identified as Yahweh, but more often he's called El or Elohim. Sometimes he's referred to as the heavenly host. El's for loser. <laughs> Do you get that L thing on your yeah. flag? <laughs> Elohim. <laughs> El was the Canaanite high god, whose name means literally God. And Elohim is the plural of El, meaning the gods. Sounds Kryptonian. El Kalel. Yes. <laughs> That's where that comes from. Oh, God, it is. Of course it does, because yeah. he's, he's a Jesus figure. Jor-El yeah. is was to- Jor, yeah. Jor of the House of God. And yeah, we jumped right into comic books, kids. Kal-El yeah, right. is <laughs> Call of the House of God. It's not okay, our fault cool. that those comic book writers do their research. No, some people are very clever. Some. So sometimes God is referred to using singular pronouns, but other times they're plural. Which, correcting for the translation error in Genesis 2, would read that the gods made man in our own image, male and female, they created them. That's a, that really is like a lot of creation stories. It sounds exactly the same. That is the actual... Yeah, yeah it's very common. That's what it should be. English right. translations make it, he created them, but they leave the... But that's an incorrect translation. Right. And they leave the R... Since it didn't seem strange to the translators of the King James Version, since King James would have used the royal we when he was commissioning the translation that bore his name. We find this interesting. So he would have said, We approve. We, the (laughs) royal James, do hereby command you to make this translation of the, the holy writ. So it's, it's, it's crazy. They, they went ahead and just let that slide. Uh, the more ex- likely explanation is the author of these texts were sometimes talking about the gods and when using heavenly host or Elohim. And then they were talking about a specific god when writing about El or Yahweh. Right. It's also likely that Yahweh replaced El at some time, hence why El is used more often in the earlier <laughs> books and Yahweh more often in the later books. Oh, yeah, definitely. No way. Oh, yeah. Yahweh. Yeah. <laughs> And then throughout the pre-exile, pre- the pre-exile stories in the Old Testament, it's clear that most of the people worshipped the gods, while a select few, sometimes just the prophets of Yahweh, worshipped only him. The politics of religion. Yeah. Monotheism versus theism versus all sorts of stuff. And especially the politics of religion when one side writes the history. Well, the winning side always writes the history, right? Like, Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and then they define what it is. But it also does clear up some of the confusion in the tenses when they were talking about, like, the multitudes. That is interesting. It's really fascinating. I had never really read on this before today. Yeah. And so we also see in the stories of First and Second Kings where the evil kings are building high places and raising Asherah poles, while some of the good kings are tearing down the high places... And cutting down the Asherah poles, while others are only removing the high places and leaving the Asherah poles. So there's a lot of religious stuff going on between different sects for like a while. For hundreds of years. It sounds pretty common to religion. It was the norm. Yeah. And it's it's been written out of history. Well, the history is covered really well in the, the, with the Roman Empire, where you started having members of Caesar's house 
becoming Christian. And then finally you get a Caesar who becomes Christian. And then the next Caesar is back to the, to the pagan roots. And then the Mm. next one's back to Christianity. And there's this back and forth over several Caesars. I thought you were going to say seasons. (laughs) I was thinking like a TV show. It's fun. It's also like that through Egyptian dynasties, Mm -hmm. uh, how they redefined uh, Akhmet and like all that other stuff was constantly defined by, uh, was it Totten Guten or however you say his name correctly, was the first one that really wanted to, the relationship between uh, the sun god was through the pharaoh and he he moved everything to like a whole new city just to change oh, yeah. the politics of his religion. Yeah. That's really, it's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Religion, it's just how religion is. I mean, we still do that. Yeah, we yeah, do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. So then these high places were where people would have been making sacrifices, sacrifices to Yahweh, mm-hmm. the God of war and to Asherah, the f- goddess of fertility. Yeah. Only sometimes would the fertility shrines be removed. Yeah, probably because they were more feminine. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna chop that one up <laughs> yeah. to sexism at the end of the day. Uh huh. So one interpretation of this would be that some of the good kings wanted people to only worship Yahweh, while some only wanted the worship of Yahweh to be in the capital where he could control it. Wow. Do you really want a lower leader out in the 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 boondocks to be able to raise up an army? And make sacrifices to the god of war and then march on the capital? Or do you want them to all have to come to the capital to make their sacrifices to the god of war? Yeah, I mean, gods of war do pretty well, generally it, speaking. It <laughs> makes yeah, perfect sense. I mean, like, they're the armed gods, though. Like, they're the gods that kick ass is, like, part of their holy tenant. Yeah. And, like, the fertility goddess, goddesses are all out here like, love your family. And the other gods are like, I don't know, kill your family. It's fine. <laughs> no, it's usually kill other temples. families. Yeah, it's everybody's family, whatever. But if you want your home life to be at all bearable, you better have a hearth and mm-hmm. an altar too. Uh... Yeah. And so some of these good good kings, they only cared about the war god. Mm-hmm. They didn't, and it would make sense that you would want people to be able to make sacrifices as conveniently as possible to the fertility goddess so that they have plentiful harvest and lots of babies. It makes sense why it would be difficult to stamp out worship to a fertility goddess because that's very rural friendly. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, like yeah. when you have low technology rates and low communication rates. Yeah, it's um, like you more of your. Uh, it's like uh, in uh, people who grow up next to the ocean have more ocean gods, and those ocean gods are more capricious because the ocean gods are capricious. Yeah, and people who grow, you know, vegetables end up serving fertility goddesses because hey, shit, we need food need harvest mm-hmm. yeah like it, it makes sense why the god of war would be centralized to where your generals are and their fertility goddess would be out the edge and eventually you know well power and, consolidates and, uh, even on the archaeological dig i did in jordan yeah there were things that were incredibly valuable like figurines and pottery shards with writing on them and then there was stuff that was garbage non-writing pottery shards and fertility figurines. Because they're very common. Right? In the one house I was working in, digging up, we found dozens wow. of these tiny little clay fertility figurines. I wish you had grabbed one. I should have. Or like a dozen. Because they were literally... they're so cool. Garbage. It's so weird. And they all look like the, the, the Venus de Milo... De, de Milo? You mean like Milo? just full-figured women? The... F- it's the yeah. It's big titties, what, fat belly. It's what no a, head, no feet. She it, thick, right? It's what a pregnant woman looks like from her own perspective. Yeah, oh, that makes sense. Interestingly, it was the bad kings who wanted pe- people to be able to make the sacrifices to the gods, including Yahweh, near their home. That sounds to me like those were actually the good kings wanting a more democratic worship of the gods. As opposed to the one that wants everybody to come to the capital and pay their taxes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, like, over centuries, politics and interests and needs would vary based upon, mm-hmm. like, all the factors of a civilization. So it's got to be a very complex oh, yeah. issue yeah. on, like, which god or gods are in charge and which people are interested in them and then how you're treated. 
Because there have been a lot of a lot of civilizations have run with multiple gods for long periods of mm-hmm. time, but not a lot of and them. And then it was just the clerics who were the freaks of nature who only worshipped the one. But if you had a calling, I think you know you know for those of us who have been involved in religious uh, lifestyles before, having a calling is something that you can just convince yourself you have. Oh yeah, and then I you just it. you could just pick uh, whatever appeals to you for whatever reason. You know, I just Power. I guess. Yeah, and especially young people. It's so easy to get teenagers. Power and influence. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if that's if that's what attracts you, I think, uh, you know, it's just, it's interesting how the politics of back then, because like when you read through a lot of scriptures in the Bible, you can easily tell they believed in a very magical universe. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the one of the actual things in the Ten Commandments is no other gods before me, which assumes there's other gods to talk about. Right. Not not like there's a wasteland of gods out there. He's like, don't worship any of those gods that don't exist. It's like, no, worship me first. I'm the important one. Yeah. Well, and what's what's crazy is you look at the like in the kings. Yeah. Uh, first and second kings. The kings in Israel almost all preferred Baal. Yeah. Where the kings of Judah usually worshipped Yahweh, occasionally Baal, which kind of sounds like Israel was actually a different tribe than Judah with a different god. And if they went to war, as people believed back then, your god is fighting against the other tribe's god. Oh, it's pretty clear through the Old Testament that that's kind those of their are, narrative. Those are two totally yeah. separate groups. Yeah. Unrelated in any way. It's, it's nuts. It's interesting. Uh, archaeologists working in the Sinai Desert have found three inscriptions that date back to the 8th century BCE mm. that asked for the blessings of Yahweh and his Asherah. Conservative Christian scholars would have you think that this means Yahweh and his sacred tree... Or Yahweh and his pole. Ah, the penis. Gay. <laughs> <laughs> but much more likely it'd be that they were asking for the blessings of Yahweh, the king of heaven and god of war, as well as Asherah, his wife, the queen of heaven and god of fertility. Seems like a more balanced pantheon. It does. Yeah. Your tribe has a god and a goddess. The next tribe has a god and a goddess. And if you're in a, a highly violent place that's the crossroads between major empires it's going to be a violent place you're going to favor your your masculine deity you're going to favor the god of war and uh don't archaeologists for the most part agree that the tribes were effectively mercenaries for a period of time especially when they moved farther south and uh it would make sense like if you give an example our current society Mm -hmm. any warlike society tends to have a more warlike god that they drift towards Right. You know, and it ties together. Like, our, like the, the American version of Jesus has a machine gun. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, and uses it, which is crazy. Amerigod is a violent, Amerigod. heavily armed asshole. Well, I mean, it, that's the exact <laughs> same God, though. I mean, mm-hmm. if you think about it. And that I think that appeals to a certain aspect of cultural uh, masculinity. Uh, and it definitely speaks towards uh, any anxieties that your people might have. Mm-hmm. Well, our God is a strong God and he kicks ass, you know, and that's very, I know that's very much like the typical patriotic rednecks opinion of God anyway. Yeah. It's like, our God kicks Versus some ass. Our God is a loving God and will welcome all into our borders. No. But he also brings a sword. You know what I mean? Like there are, ver- there are enough verses out there for them to cherry pick where oh, yeah. Jesus isn't the, uh, the you know, uh, leprosy loving hippie that he is in the uh gospels but any of the any time when he just casually drops a oh also we'll nuke your family ha ha <laughs> kind of like jesus the jock god right yeah, yeah. bro bro jesus bro you even lift bro <laughs> before the babylonian exile most of the prophets weren't worried about asher worship they were more concerned just with baal yeah because he's a lot different the god of the masculine god of the neighboring tribes but then they started blaming God's wrath after the exile on their worship of Asherah. Gotta have a scapegoat. Yep. The prophet Jeremiah went to Egypt to join those who had also escaped the exile to Babylon, where he found a group of Jews that he was really pissed at, and he chastised the people for their idolatry. And the people responded, and I quote, 
as for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. We will do everything that we have vowed, make offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we did both we and our fathers, our kings and our officials in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and prospered and saw no disaster. But since we left off making offerings to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. You know, it sounds a lot like when Christians say we took prayer out of schools and that's why people get, that's like the same it attitude. Is. It's like, oh it to- yeah, totally. you guys stopped doing it the right way. So that's why you're <laughs> suffering. God, it's such a pretentious dick way to talk about your religion. That was Jeremiah <laughs> 44, 16 to 18. Wow. If you read that section and you continue on, the women have their own say on the matter and they are even more forceful. Well, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the part that I quoted is, is more the part where it's the, it's the men who are, quote, allowing their wives to make sacrifices to the queen of heaven. Dudes really have a problem with uh, <laughs> accessibility and consent. I like, know that's so funny. So by the end of the exile, the Jewish people were monotheistic. There was one God, Yahweh, who was responsible for all that is good, and one fallen archangel who was responsible for all that was bad. And it was no longer that their God would punish them for evil, it's just that he would remove his protection from the evil one, who would then be free to have his way with God's people. I, I just love that outlook, because, I mean, technically, the devil's an employee, uh-huh. Like he works for God as the bad cop. It's a good cop, bad cop situation. And the devil literally is just a threat that God uses to like to terrify you into right behavior. Right. It's an yeah. interesting way to manipulate your people into behaving. It's like, well, if you believe and you do the right things, then the devil won't get you. But Which is why I always thought of, of God as doing like a ventriloquist act. Yeah, right. Like he's got this little sock puppet of a devil over. He's like, well, watch out for that guy. Yeah, he's going to get he's you. He's going to get you. Yeah, it, but it's just interesting too because we paint uh, we paint the Christian God as this uh, purveyor of peace, love, and forgiveness. But if you fuck it up, you're tortured forever. I, it's just a yeah, weird Yeah, where's system. the forgiveness in that? Second Samuel, God tempts david to conduct a census first chronicles the devil satan tempts david to do the census yeah well you know same story different character it is just yeah it's different based upon who your antagonist is in that story but the stories where god is playing the Trixie antagonist like two halves of a smeagol you know with his with his prophets really are kind of messed up how often God tests his people because he can read their mind. Like uh, Job. And my, he knows what's going to happen, right? right? Which it's weird when you examine a God outside time. Because if a God, if, if time is a construct that God, he already knows the future. So literally everything that you do and happens to you is by his design. So because that's the way that he set it up. Yeah. Yeah, it's so weird. And so all of this paints a picture of A Canaanite tribe that would become the Jews, having many gods, then trimming it down to just Yahweh and Asherah, the king and queen of heaven. Simple. Easier bookwork. You cover one to give you plentiful harvests and lots of babies, and one to keep you from being destroyed by the Assyrians and the Egyptians. Yeah. That's all you need. And then the period began where the kings would alternate between maintaining the old order of worshiping their war god and the fertility goddess and to then rejecting the fertility goddess. Then by the time that they as a people are destroyed by war, they decide that only the war god matters. Definitely get precedence in wartime. Yeah. Well, it's only during peacetime that you're really concerned about uh, having enough food to make it through the winter. During wartime, you've got some other things you need to worry about. Well, I mean, it's it's a part of the whole logistics issue. An army does march on its stomach, like, and it's complicated. I, I yeah, it's a very complex issue. Yeah. Then we had twenty five hundred years of editors and translators trying to write their theology back into the text, right? Of yeah. an ancient people, and priests and pastors have explained away the bits that they failed to edit out. Well, yeah, that is interesting way with the way uh, Christianity works, too, because it's like, 
belief stacked on belief stacked on beliefs and then each writer wants to like retranslate everything into their own theology like you were saying Mm -hmm. and then and then of course it's all seen through the lens of the current you know culture as it were yeah because it's interesting how like modern christians view most of the bible as being a, a maybe or a we don't need to pay attention to this you know, like, uh, I, I don't know what the traditional, I don't know what the traditional name for it is, but the idea of the new contract, the new order, when Jesus shows up, all right, God's no longer an asshole. Now, the new covenant. Yeah, the new covenant. There it is. Yeah. yeah. God's no longer a dick. That's the idea. And it's like, yeah, but it also says God's the same forever. Like, you don't really get to be both, hey, I've changed my mind. It's been a few thousand years. Let's be nice to each other now. It's like, oh, you mean just because things are starting to calm down? Because that would be God admitting that he was fallible. Or just that he's bipolar or some shit. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, you know. I mean, God's well, all like, and, and now it's fine. Which, which you see in Chris Matheson's The Story of God. Mm-hmm. He he definitely covers that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just it's it's just an interesting. I mean, speaking as atheists, it's pretty easy to see this as problematic. I'm always kind of curious, like, you know, when you're in the faith, you know, why it's so hard to see this huge obvious gap between like the way people. Uh, behave in the way they're told to. I don't know. Just weird. Just imagine how much less misogynistic Christianity would be if they'd kept the Queen of Heaven. I don't think it would have stopped anything. No? No. Okay. I mean, not historically, because you can be pretty sexist and still have some women gods. True. It's, uh, and it, I, I just, it can go either way. I just don't, traditionally, uh, oh yeah, look at India. It's yeah, you know, and they're still with the caste system, and they're the largest. They're the largest democracy on the planet. Mm-hmm. So it's just, just difficult. Uh, I don't know. I it would be nice to. It's it's nice to fantasize about a friendlier Christianity. And when you meet friendlier Christians, like say, you know, we know when you're at a pride event and the inclusive church churches come mm-hmm. out and they're super cool. I'm cool with those Christians because for the most part, those aren't the ones that try to mandate through laws that we should be Christians. They're the ones that are more like, Oh, we accept queers. We accept marginalized people. We're not out here trying to like make your life or the way that you exist, uh, against the law. Mm-hmm. Those are always the Dick Christians, which, uh, their idea of, uh, religious persecution is, uh, them not being in charge. Yeah. Yeah. There, they normalize it, but also modern, and, and that's very much a theme today. Is modern Christianity is uh, <clears throat> driven by the concept that they're persecuted, no matter how much they're in charge. Mm-hmm. And you can see the same thing on the way the Republicans have been running for the last two years, despite being in control of every single piece of well, the government. They're the ones that are under attack. Well, and that's, let's let's get to that. Yeah, let's go. As part of the Trump administration's official response to the Tree of Life shooting, the White House counsel, Kellyanne Conway, went on Fox and Friends and had a very interesting conclusion as to who is to blame. Let's listen to her own words. The anti-religiosity in this country, that it's somehow in vogue and funny to make fun of anybody of faith, to constantly be making fun of people who express religion, the late night comedians, the unfunny Uh, people on TV shows, it's always anti-religious. And remember, these people were gunned down in their place of worship, as were the people in South Carolina several years ago. Mm -hmm. And they were there because they're people of faith, and it's that faith that needs to bring us together. This is no time to be driving God out of the public square. No time to be making fun of people. That's right. Mikey, it's all your fault. Uh, Well, that's fine. Well, I also love love the whole... uh, Okay, so the first thing I personally want to address as a comedian's aside... Is she has to call them comedians and then immediately tries to take it away from them. It's actually something that happens in dialogue with anyone who knows you're a comedian. The first logic fallacy you always get is, well, you're not being funny right now. You're not a comedian. Like, you're only allowed to be like you are in your job. Mm -hmm. Which is just, it happens to comedians and almost nobody else. It's like, well, what you said wasn't very funny. Well, fuck you. I'm not trying to be funny. Like, I'm not always, like, especially me, I'm not always that funny in person. I have a very wry and dark, sarcastic sense of humor that comes out on stage. And it's because I spend a lot of my time thinking about this dumb bullshit. Like, uh, it's difficult. And then we also fail to ignore that one of the most popular late night comedians, Colbert, is historically a devout Catholic. Yes, he is. You see, he definitely points out Christian hypocrisy. He's done so to an excellent degree over years. He's won awards for it. 
And we, you can't just, I mean, you can't just be like, oh yeah, these really smart people that talk about this all the time don't know what they're talking about just because they disagree with me. Mm-hmm. And that's just an interesting, been, I've been reading and, and, and watching a lot of stuff lately on uh, the division of politics in the United States. And a lot of it comes from this kind of stuff where uh, they're trying to conflate all religions together because it gives them larger numbers. Uh, this is happening worldwide in a lot of places where uh, Christians or the religion in charge will be like, well, this is just anti-religious stuff. You're with me, guys, right? Any attack on the Jews is automatically an attack on the Christians, which is what she basically just said. Oh, yeah. The shooter was somebody who thinks that Trump doesn't go far enough. Yeah. Like, I think uh, Jim Jeffries pointed out, like, how how racist do you have to be to think Donald Trump isn't racist enough? Like, with all the whistle, yeah. the dog whistles that he does and all the things that he says... How bad do you have to be to be like, yeah, Donald Trump, he really is that, you know, fucking hippie, tree-hugging. He's so benevolent. He's controlled by the Jews because his son-in-law is involved in his administration. Well, to them, the presence of any Jewish person means the whole thing's tainted. It's very much one of those, you're not white if you have a drop of non-white blood in you attitudes. Mm -hmm. They've always done this, whether it's the Rothschilds or the Soros. They like having a Jewish devil man to scare. It's the, it's the devil concept writ smaller. Right. Instead of the devil, it's the Jewish guy and, with all the money. And it was an attack on a religious service. Therefore, it was an attack on religion. Even though the guy who did it was like a Lutheran. We're going to ignore right. that. He's inspired. It, it, the idea that... Uh, it, and it's not like you can't actually have violent form of atheism. Like Atheists are weird when we believe it's that happened. we're not capable of that. It's just that... There's really nobody blowing up churches or shooting up churches and being like, for nihilism. Like, there's just <laughs> nobody that fucking does that. Right. <laughs> Everyone always has a banner, and it's never that one. It's never, we believe in nothing, so fuck you guys. Because what, what nihilism and a general, like, just understanding of how the cosmos works tends to actually drive you into apathy if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. As opposed to, like, extremist action, you end up being like, I'm just going to fuck around with my life because I only have so long. And one of the problems that we have... Uh, I believe in atheist atheism as a culture is the wide percentage of us that are not active because once you realize that there's not any meaning to life, it's really easy to be like, well, my life is best, you know, experienced if I'm not involved in these conversations. Mm -hmm. And because what I mean, atheism is the third largest belief group in the world. Yeah. But we're always treated like we're a minority. Right. This uh, this is one of the few times when they're they're starting to realize that there is, especially with young people, a movement away from belief. Like mm-hmm. the Church of England, the rates of people in church are so low now, they're thinking of changing their laws to reflect that because there's still people in the House of Lords that are from the C of E mm-hmm. that, and that they don't accurately reflect the ways of the people of England. Yeah. And I, that, I think that terrifies religious people. All right, so Mike Pence spoke at a campaign rally in Michigan. Oh, great. And in light of the shooting, decided to, uh, well, not it wasn't him, but the organizers of the rally uh, invited a, quote, leader in the Jewish community here in Michigan, mm-hmm. end quote. This is Rabbi Lauren Jacobs. Yeah, he's like a Jews for Jesus type dude. Well, let's listen how he opened his prayer. Great. Which the opening actually isn't the weirdest part of his prayer slash campaign speech. Mm -hmm. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God and father of my Lord and savior, Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. That's not, it's a, it's the idea of a Christian's, it's a hard line Christian's idea of a compromise. (laughs) We'll bring in a Jew, but it's going to be one of our Jews. <laughs> right. Like, one of the good ones. They just normalize everything <laughs> from that Christian standpoint. And one of the difficulties of dealing with that, the, that movement is getting them to be inclusive in the conversation. You know, there's just a score of stories out there of whenever the prayer is somebody that's not a Christian, all of a sudden it's disrespectful or it's, or they'll do something about it. Like the even, or the idea of having like, a atheist uh no what are they not pastors but in the military like there's chaplains yeah chaplains like the chaplains duties have have more to do with non-religious functions Mm -hmm. than religious functions and it's very useful to have there's no reason why you wouldn't have an occasional non-believer in there because the job isn't any different 
You know, it's almost like, well, what's your religion? What do we need right. to do for you? Which is how I think a society should behave if we're going to have religion with us for a while. And we are. I, mean, I don't care what the numbers say, but we're going to have to find a way to live with religious types for quite a long time. The homogenization of human culture is lasting way long into the information age. Mm-hmm. And it's probably going to be even longer before we give up the ghost, so to speak, on this. But like, OK, for, for a good example on it, the National Day of Prayer here in Boise. Mm-hmm. They make a point of having Jews come. Yeah. They don't get the rabbi of the local synagogue. They get a rabbi member Fink. of the Messianic Jews. Oh, yeah. We're, we, we're very much like that here in Boise. When we did National Day of Reason, when we got the capital steps, mm-hmm. Rabbi Fink from the synagogue here in Boise spoke for our event. Yeah, he's yeah, awesome. Yeah. But I mean, if you actually listen or talk to Jewish scholars, they're very much more in line with uh-huh. agnostic and atheistic way of thinking because their wisdom is wisdom that you can use. <laughs> and if you talk to anybody who is not an evangelical Christian mm-hmm. and you ask them about the Messianic Jews, they're evangelical Christians playing Jewish. It's very much a, they want a two for one special mm-hmm. and they, they have been called out with that more and more, uh, like in, uh, places like Twitter where there are a lot of outspoken people uh, calling that out as very performative, very, uh, it's very presumptuous to just take on the Jewish trappings and pretend you're Jewish. All right. We're going to move on soon, but. Two Muslim groups, Celebrate Mercy and Empower Change, raised $150,000 from 3,600 anonymous donors yeah. in 48 hours. And this money will cover all funeral and related expenses for everyone who died in that synagogue. This is, this is uh, well, I'm going to say mad respect to this group of people. Uh, it's simple. Uh, to me, if you say that you have a belief and you act on that belief, I have so much more respect for you. Because in their religion, um, giving is a relationship between them and like their God, mm-hmm. same God, incidentally, but their relationship between God, which is one of the reasons why it's anonymous, Yep, is you're not, you're supposed to just give because it's the thing to do. And I like this because if you see in other countries where violence against religious minorities is common, you'll actually see religions coming together and protecting each other. You know, there's lots of pictures of there out there of Christians surrounding Muslims in some countries and vice versa. Like he even offered to surround their house of worship so they'd feel better. Yeah. You know, and that's what happens in violent countries like ours. And what you see here is like the Interfaith Alliance. Mm -hmm. There aren't a lot of Christians there. It's unfortunate, but yeah. It's mostly all the non-Christian groups, including the humanists and Unitarians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists. The minority religious groups have a tendency to band together. Yeah, they've actually had the Unitarian Church has had me speak uh, before. Oh, nice. Yeah, and they're very inclusive. They're very yeah. aggressive uh, trying to get people to join their little group, which is cute. Oh, yeah. But uh, they're very inclusive and they're super friendly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like it. And they're very, and they tend to be as a group religious, religious, uh, when religions get together, they tend to actually be more progressive. Yeah. than when they're singular which is interesting and in that they're more like oh no no we'll look out for each other oh no no we raised you guys 150 grand yeah and all the extra money in that ends up going to programs designed to build unity between those two religions yep which is a, just on the base level something that we in a secular society would want because we want everyone to be able to share the playground which is ultimately the idea of our country is that everyone gets the best ideas together and that we all share the space and it's something we've drifted away from in politics in the uh, the verses and the other. And it, a lot of it's been driven by really how to control Christian ideology. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's move to Pakistan, where in 2016, Asia Bibi, a Christian Pakistani woman, was convicted of insulting the Prophet Muhammad and sentenced to death. That's well, a big deal in a lot of the world still. Then the Pakistani Supreme Court, just in the past week or two, has overturned her conviction and released her from prison. Prison. It was under political pressure. Oh yeah, like they lot. didn't do this on their own. Yeah. They're not like, oh, sorry. They're like, okay, yeah, yeah, my bad. We didn't mean to upset everybody. So then, after being reunited with her family, they started making plans to accept one of the several offers of asylum that she's received. Yeah, because culturally, she's still totally she's, she's fucked. Totally fucked. Yeah. yeah, it's unfortunate because she wanted to get out of Pakistan before getting lynched, which is a real possibility for her. So the government officials have 
responded to this by barring her from leaving the country and massive protests are demanding that the conviction and death sentence be reinstated and that she be executed immediately. This is bad enough her lawyer has had to flee the country. It's rough. This is insane. <laughs> but also, uh, it's difficult to understand um, uh, in a lot of different cultures, if you do something wrong, the people who support you afterwards are also considered to be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, we recently had a stabbing this last summer in Boise. Yeah. And uh, one of the social workers who helped the woman who brought the stabber into the community, she was ostracized by her community immediately. Uh, because she brought the man in that ended up killing a little girl and attacking everybody with a knife. And the people who helped her move were then ostracized. Mm. Even though all they did was help her move out of a situation where the people blamed her. So in a lot of communities, if you even if you're paid to help somebody, they consider you to have been yeah. uh, contributing to that misdoing. And it's, so it's super terrifying that even if... Because if they're coming after the helpers, then there's definitely... Oh, yeah. A movement. Okay, so her case may be reconsidered, and her lawyer's out of the country. Yeah, it's really rough. This Unless she can get over to India and get on a plane to Europe, she's dead. Uh, there's a good possibility of that. The only real way to combat this at this point is, um, you know, international pressures, because even the larger countries can bend to the will of the unified group oh, yeah. think. It's difficult, uh, because... All major countries uh, are uh, built upon uh, human rights violations. Now, interestingly, <laughs> this is actually a case where the United States, even with the Trump administration, might apply pressure. Because she's a Christian. Yep. If she was an atheist, they wouldn't say anything. Oh, no. Yeah. No, that would just be Canada and the EU. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, yeah. Or any, any other country that's operating from a non-religious point of view would also be like, I don't, maybe not... Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, the movements in how you deal with uh, somebody else's religion really test the bounds of free speech sometimes. You know, and mm -hmm. I know we we uh, we tend to really make a hard line for that First Amendment here in the United States, but it's definitely not globally uniform. Well, that segues nicely into our next story. An Austrian woman, known in the article as Mrs. S, was convicted of disparaging religious doctrines in 2011 for two seminars she gave on Islam, which included talking about Muhammad's six-year-old wife. Muslims eat, will admit that the relationship was consummated when she was nine. Yeah, which was supposed to be a, a good thing at the time. Well, I didn't have sex when she was six. Right, wait until she was nine. Oh my God. Mrs. S called that pedophilia. Well, it is. Exactly. I mean, and there's not really, I mean, there's very few groups of adults that aren't going to call that pedophilia. According to what Muslims say about Muhammad and his child bride, mm -hmm. Muhammad was a pedophile. Period. Historical facts make religions uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even going back to how we started this whole podcast, uh, it doesn't matter how much actual facts that you dig up out of the ground or that you look in actual, use, you know, actual science to discover things. It's going to be difficult for them to accept it because it, it undermines their ideological authority. Yeah. The fact that there are people who worshipped God and another God. That's, that's mind-boggling to it's a modern Christian. And it's very clear in the text that that's what used yeah. to happen. And a lot of their wars were theology-driven. And they're mm -hmm. always presented as, well, God told us to go kick the crap out of these guys because they worship the yeah. wrong God. So, Mrs. Mm, weird reason. Mrs. S. Appeal, has appealed this case ever since her conviction. As she should. And it finally made it to the European Court of Human Rights where they determined that defaming the Prophet Muhammad goes beyond, or quote, goes beyond the permissible limits of an objective debate and, quote, could stir up prejudice and put at risk religious peace. They determined that protecting religious feelings, they actually worded it as religious feelings, is more important than free expression. Well, it's culturally where they're at. I mean, remember the, the amount of different communities and cultures in the European underneath that blanket is this vast. And while we are the third largest group of belief, the, the, their belief is second. 
Yeah. And literally in the, in their explanation, they say, hey, maybe, because they only find her a couple hundred bucks. Like, it's too much from our perspective. Uh-huh. But uh, considering how the hard line it is in the religion to do so, it was a slap on the wrist. But they're, they're stating... Uh, fine, but it was a, a criminal conviction. Well, it's like, don't rock the boat. That was That's literally their message. And as the European, as that group ends up evolving, because remember, France is hardline on this issue. Mm -hmm. They very much don't allow religious costuming. They make laws against even uh, religious wear in public because Mm -hmm. they're very hardline on the amount of damage that religion can do, undermining to their society. Obviously, they still have issues, but the rest of Europe isn't that hardcore. And they still have a lot of population where they don't. They don't want to have, especially considering the amount of politics that the the Europeans have been going through to try to consolidate everything for, God, what is it, decades now? Like, I, I get it. I don't agree with it. Well, it's especially bizarre looking at Austria because part of immigrating to Austria is an education plan on how you're going to assimilate into Austrian culture. Like, how quickly are you going to adopt the correct dialect of German? Yeah. And become an assimilated Austrian. Well, they do actually have land problems, though. It's not like, I mean, they're a small country, and Mm -hmm. they actually might, I mean, it's a weird ethnocentric way to do things, but I come from the opposite country where, in theory, Uh you don't have to do that. But Austria wants to force everybody who immigrates to assimilate a refugee coming in must agree to assimilate into becoming an Austrian, and yet they want to make sure that you don't piss off Muslims too much. Uh, it's difficult. It's uh, it's, very, it's just weird. I think it's weird, but also I don't really expect any community to be like, you know, in agreement with itself all the time. We are we all contain multitudes, and it's difficult to manage. I I personally don't think it's a great precedent to set. But also, I'm from a culture where, you know, uh, being able to say whatever you want, Mm -hmm. even though it might come with consequences, is allowed. And there have been plenty of times in our own country where people have drawn things or said things, and then our own processes have pulled things off the air or have, like... Because remember when uh, South Park first did, uh, they actually had Muhammad in a cartoon fairly early Mm -hmm. on before they were big. Oh, yeah. And it passed. And then later, when they wanted to draw him in another cartoon, they were actually told by censors not they couldn't. For the exact same cultural reasons. They were more worried about the pushback they would get by making fun of one religious figure instead of, you know, all the rest. And they mm-hmm. hit on everybody else, but they were concerned about this one group of people because of how it might affect some of them. Right. It's difficult. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's... Uh... It's good to talk about, but yeah. it would be nice. It'll be nice when we finally get past that, whenever that happens. But we're also culturally dealing with... Uh, uh, adapting to uh, outrage mm-hmm. as you know, we have a very diverse way of looking at things and people often mistake um, somebody pointing out something as problematic with being offended. You know, that happens a lot online when I mention, like, for instance, blackface, don't do that. Yeah. And then people are like, you're offended. I'm like, I'm not offended. I'm just not, a, I'm just not an empty headed dick bag. That's just going to do that. Like, it, it's not that I'm offended. It's just that I, I think this should stop. And that's part of the problem because there's a lot of talk and even from some of my favorite comedians about like from our point of view, like, well, if you're offended about me being an atheist, that's on you. But they're we're, they're not offended. They just think it's a problem because mm-hmm. they you know think atheists are going to hell and we're dragging the rest of the culture down with us, which goes back to Kellyanne Conway again. Yeah. Being upset that anybody but the religious right of their religion has a voice even willing to co-opt other religious tragedies because an attack on the Jews is really an attack on us. So what's what's interesting here is the European Courts of Human Rights European Court of Human Rights has determined that blasphemy laws are okay while in a referendum in Ireland 65% voted to repeal their blasphemy law. Oh, absolutely, but that's an old law. It's a really old law. And nobody's and nobody's been persecuted for it really like you, uh, people even challenge them to prosecute them for it. <laughs> well, that's because they want to change the law. I mean, that actually that happens over here a lot too. Uh, you know, like changing the anti-sodomy laws. 
on a federal level because we had so- anti sodomy laws mm-hmm. in Idaho uh, where things like oral sex were technically against the law, those even are in a consensual s- marriage. Those are still on the books, right? But you can't you can't, you can't actually enforce it. enforce it anymore. Yeah, and so and that's it's very similar to that because uh, that whole part of Europe is definitely becoming more and more secular. Secular. Uh, they're definitely becoming more atheist as yeah. we go on. And there's this secular. weird... There it is, secular. There's ah. this weird trend in, in Europe where you have the countries that are becoming far more secular, and there's ones that are trying to figure out how to maintain the peace with growing Muslim populations. Right, and it's a growth... I think that's a growth spurt through getting over religion. Mm-hmm. And as the religions, if the religions become more and more marginalized, we in the majority are going to have to still try not to upset the boat too much. There's no reason to take us down the road of persecuting Muslims because we think their beliefs are ridiculous mm-hmm. any more than we should in this country be persecuting the Mormons. If the Mormons ever get out of power in this part of the country, we shouldn't immediately flip it and attack the Mormons. We should allow them to slowly die out. Yeah. If that's yeah. what happens. I mean, clearly, I don't, I'm not against, we just, once again, historical facts mm-hmm. kind of work against them. But yeah. All right. 14 staff members at Middleton Heights Elementary School in Middleton, Idaho, have been placed on administrative leave for their Halloween costumes. And this was, this just hit, this just went viral, like, what, yesterday or the day before? Like, it hit CBS News this weekend. Yeah, it's, it's, it yeah. just happened this last week. And yeah, That's like Halloween. 40 miles from where we're sitting right now. It's super close. Oh, it's not even, I don't think it's even 40. It's close. It's I've, within 40 miles. I've done, I've been a guest speaker at Middle, uh, Middleton Middle School. Yeah. Twice. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's it, it, the excuses have been uh, pretty popular. As everyone in the actual mm-hmm. administration, it wants to act like, oh, this was just an oversight. Students were supposed to see this, but if a group of employees can get together to organize something that has a racial component to it, okay, so somebody should be able to say Stop. what they did was one group dressed as the wall. Trump's wall. The words "Make America Great" written across it. Mm-hmm. The other group dressed as caricatures of Mexicans. Right. One even had a sombrero with Mexican written across it. Right, half dressed as Mexicans, the other half dressed as the wall. Uh, it, just like I said, I mean, a whole group of your team was on, like, I, I can't, I, I don't expect everyone to be an outspoken jerk like I am at work. But when that kind of stuff happens, you should have the freedom to be like, hey, maybe not. There's a lot of people from Central and South America that live in that part of the state. Um, yeah, yeah, it's I've, rural Idaho. Right. I've taught, again, I've, I've done two, I've been a guest speaker twice at Middleton Elementary, or Middleton Middle School. It's not all white. Oh, yeah, no. definitely. No, no. Any yeah. part where, where there's that much farmland is definitely not all white. It, it also creates the interesting mix of basically everybody white is probably from a Muslim family. And everybody who's not white is Latino and probably from a Catholic family. Yeah, there's an interesting mix of people Yeah, uh, in Middleton. It, you meant Mormon, not Muslim. Oh, yeah, I meant Mormon. Oh, Sorry. yeah, good catch. Yeah. And I was like, white we do have Muslims? We do have white Muslims here, the, the, the Bosnian community. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. I do, I do want to say that the, I, I have read the explanation for what happened. Yeah, right. Uh, and supposedly each group was given a country to represent. Um, These two particular groups decided to do a political satire and uh, it blew up in their faces. Well, that's because it's a civilian trying to do comedy again. That's their problem. Yeah, there's that. Um, (laughs) So these teachers like, well, let's let's portray America, since we got the USA, let's portray America how the world sees us. Which is wall building. Yeah. It, I, I think it, yeah, I really do think it is. And then, of course, the Mexican side decided to do the caricatures. Nobody should have thought that that was okay ever. Uh, but that, yeah. they, they claim that this was to to promote this team building exercise on cultural sensitivity, and it ended up backfiring. Well, um, pictures were taken and... And posted online. Posted online, we, yep. Intentionally. Like it's just the problem is is uh, either culturally nobody was allowed to speak out or there's nobody who wanted to speak out. Like those are the only two outcomes because it's one of those things that it, the reason it became viral so fast is you immediately go, well, that's not a good idea, and then you go, wait, a whole room full of people thought that was a good idea. Uh-huh. What's wrong um, with you guys? I mean, typically teachers tend to be a little bit more left, so I can see a group of teachers 
saying, okay, we got America. Let's show what the world thinks of us, and we're going to show it as Trump's America. Now, on the flip side, the most conservative teachers in the Treasure Valley are going to be probably in Middleton. Yeah. Well, the place actually has a long history of racism, and a lot of people don't realize the actual pervasiveness of white supremacists throughout that part of the state. Oh, my God. Yeah, they yeah, have like no idea how bad just, it they is. They just don't know. But Idaho culturally has a long history of uh, try to underrepresent the uh, amount of people that live here that are huge assholes yeah. because they want the state to seem nice. And a lot of the reasons the state seems nice is people keep their mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And that's why stuff like this happens. And I like the idea. It just the thing is, is it feels like spin. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and, and putting these people on paid leave is fine. It was it was just a bad judgment call. I mm -hmm. just on, on every single level. I can't imagine being in any group project where someone's like, I want you to dress up as a Mexican. I'm going to go. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. I mean, like, you guys could do it, but all them or made the other decision. At least choose, like, a culturally relevant costume, not the um, cheap it's, Halloween yeah, dress you sing, that these guys were wearing. Using Halloween and... This apparently was not related to Halloween at all. The, but the entire project is... It just happened was a at bad the end of October. <laughs> because if you ask somebody to dress in a way that represents another country... What's going to happen? You're going to get caricatures or pretty ugly cultural appropriations. I just, uh, you know, I... It's I just never going to end well. I don't see a way of doing it sensitive no. enough. Like, that's an education issue. And especially, the, all your educators are white and your students aren't. You just have to be more aware. And unfortunately, Idaho is 48th in education. And uh, we pay very little so we actually lose a lot of our best educators. Mm -hmm. I don't. Which think is why putting these guys on leave was such a hit because there's no teachers to replace. Which is the system's fault, and I get it. Like it totally sucks. But also, the wheels of public school move small, and it's not like they're going to cover a ton of ground in however many weeks it yeah. takes. I just the and issue. To, yeah, they're also not going to get fired because. There aren't teachers to replace them. Well, I mean, it, they can't afford. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of, the way that Idaho runs its own money, there's a reason why we're always, but we're always borrowing from the feds. Yep. We're always underwater. We used to have a balanced budget amendment, and then we had surpluses for too long, and the Republicans, the Republicans got rid of it. You know, the, the, you know, I mean, they like to pretend that they're in it for the money, but if you give them a pile of money, the Republicans will spend the fuck out of all of it. And Idaho just doesn't have that many different ways to make money right now. Mm -hmm. Like we're not in, we're not really like we have a couple tech monsters that hang out here, but it's only because we don't tax them. There's yep. no real benefit, you know. And a lot of those places don't pay very well. Or in Idaho, it, the, the depressed wages in this state are crazy. So I understand the cultural effects. I just don't. I just really feel like teachers need to be held to a higher standard when uh, that is put out in the public eye. It damages the students locally. All right. So how about state legislators? Well, we don't like most of the state legislators. Washington State Representative Matt Shea wrote a, and he's of, uh, from the Spokane Valley. Which is Idaho adjacent. Yep. <laughs> right yeah. across the border from Coeur d'Alene. He wrote a four-page manifesto that he titled, quote, Biblical Basis for War. Yeah, I, mean, I just think white guy writing manifesto is the only thing. Like, that's everything all you after need. that's going to uh -huh. be bad. Yep, uh, probably written in red on a wall somewhere. Okay, this gets worse. Yeah, it does. He described the Christian God as a warrior. Yeah. Okay, that's actually pretty accurate. Yahweh was the war God, as we already discussed. They really like that. And he calls for creating an army to fight against the evils of same-sex marriage, abortion, and other violations of what he quotes he considers to be biblical law. For those who don't comply, he calls for killing all males. Oh, yeah. That's, what this is is Old Testament cosplay. Like, it's very much oh, like uh, he wants it to be the Old Testament. He really, because that's the language of the Old Testament. Very much so, like, killing any group of people. Let's kill all the males or the adults. I mean, you're only one step from everyone except uh, children and women who haven't had sex yet, like, mm -hmm. which is legit Old Testament. Or dash the baby's heads upon the rock, Old Testament yeah. God. Well, there were there were the three levels of of how you deal with the evil ones. You kill all males. Then there's you kill all males and all non-virgin females, and then you kill everyone. Yeah, it's pretty much the final step, cleansing. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's just intense. I I hate to always like it's 
the sliding, the slippery slope fallacy, the nose of the camel, is always emotionally difficult because it comes up a lot, but it always feels like we're stepping too close to the fire when you even jokingly say stuff like that. And his whole take is he's spinning it out as some sort of allegory and metaphors, the typical Mm -hmm. uh, religious teacher excuse. Oh, I wasn't meaning literally. I just wrote it literally and sent it to people literally. And I'm shocked that the FBI got involved because I only wrote, I only wrote about killing dudes. Like, why is that a problem? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, they don't, they don't understand because it's so normalized in their own community. And they're so used to vilifying uh, something that is not what they believe that it just slips out of their mouth that that's what they want to do. Mm-hmm. So, like, the best way to get rid of they, it, it, they, it's like they don't realize that you can't, so you need straight people to make queer people. For the most part, there's not enough bi and pan people to replace all the queers. Like, yeah. so there's not enough of us fucking to replace everybody else. So even if you killed every queer person in the country, like just murdered the shit out of them, you'd get more. There'd be mm-hmm. more already living that were just pretending not to be queer. Yep. Like it's it's just so bizarre. It's it's like the their belief in abortion is the same way. I they believe that abortion is murder. I don't, but we know factually that even if we make abortion illegal, women will still do it. All they're going to do is it's going to be more dangerous. We're mm-hmm. going to lose more lives. It's going to be unhealthy doctors the doctors that do still perform abortions will now be operating outside the law when they're just trying to help people. Yeah. Like, Oh heck, even if, if your only goal is to make sure that there are more babies born, keeping abortion legal is the way to do that. Well, yeah. You should allow women to make their own life planning decisions. You want women who are going to get abortions to not die or become sterile because of unsafe back alley abortions. Right. Absolutely. It's difficult. Uh, yeah, man. Okay, so our final one's almost comical. Okay, good. Someone vandalized a sign telling people near Hewlett, Wyoming, how far away the nearby Devil's Tower is. It's such a great name. And with spray paint, red spray paint, this person wrote, Christ's, one time with an apostrophe, one time without, over devils, and painted crosses Next to the number of miles. It's adorable. It is so... Like, I imagine some teenager just being a dick. Probably did this. It, you know, it could be anybody. And it's also hard to yeah. tell how, how serious... Because nobody thinks that they're... Like, that this is a monument to Satan. No, they do. They do. I <laughs> Having been in that mental <laughs> oh space... Oh my God, really? Well, okay, having been in that mental space... Uh, when, I was, when I was in Pentecostal churches as a teenager... And not just my dad's weird church, but other churches... They convinced us that all, even drug uh, ideogra- uh, I- uh, ideography was all uh, all Satanist. Like, they call everything a Satanist thing. Like, they believe that Satan is real. Like, if you ever read, like, the Piercing the Dark, the Darkness books, mm-hmm. like, they believe that there's actual principalities and powers, their terminology, that exist in the world that we fight against with the power of our prayer. Which is why we hold like prayer vigils, because oh, we wow. empower the forces of God by being uh, by being better Christians and praying and all that other stuff, because they believe that although God is 100 percent in control of every molecule of reality, he still has to go to war against the forces of darkness. Yeah. And it's that weird double thing. So they really do believe that if the devil it's the same reason why they hate the Satanists, a Satanists are the sexiest uh, religion of all of them, because God, Satan is just a sexy character <laughs> like he brings knowledge and understanding and fire like uh he, he, from from objective point of view uh satan has done more for humanity than god has mm-hmm. like just by making just the idea to question things is something yea hath god said so yeah. to speak is this is undermining everything of christian belief and thought is second guessing religion so and, and devil's tower was a sacred native american site right it's already a dick move that we named it after our own religion. Well, I mean, place. obviously, people, I mean, we, it, when you see it, it is awe-inspiring. And Roosevelt was, President Roosevelt was, like, pretty yeah. pretty amazed by it. He's yeah, like, okay, you know what? <laughs> for public. You, far, that's yeah. going to be the first U.S. national monument right there. It's Okay. Yeah. It's pretty badass. You, it's pretty good. Cool. It's in far northeastern Wyoming. That's the, the the prairie, the plains, and there's this giant rock sticking up. 
It's so cool. It's it's fantastic. And apparently it was only named Devil's Tower because the the interpreter for the um one of those first uh groups mm-hmm. heading out west, the interpreter mis misread it as um Devil's Tower when it was supposed to be the Bad God's Tower and the Bad God was related to the bears. So it sh- so all the natives in that area referred to it as the bear, like Bears Rock or Bears Lodge or Bears Tower. It makes sense. Okay. Um, but he misinterpreted it as the bad gods. So gris- tower, grizzly thus tower, calling would, it devils. So grizzly tower would be more accurate. Not grizzly, but bear. Bear. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's like how uh, Table Rock is really like Eagle Rock in the yep. local native tongue. Mm-hmm. But we named it Table Rock and then put a cross on it and sold that land illegally so that yeah. we could have a cross over the city, despite the fact that that was all originally like. Like holy ground, like yeah. Then and we just and now we just you know we go. And when you look at the over. valley, it makes sense as to why that would be a sacred mm-hmm. place because well, you yeah. see the entire valley oh, from that point. I've I've been to an a high place with an altar carved into it. It was at Petra. Yeah. Um, it is ridiculously amazing, and there is a standing stone there, a, a an obelisk. When you have a case like Table Rock here, it's would be a logical place to have your holy site we should we need to get an obelisk up there if you look at devil's yeah, yeah. tower it is an obelisk yeah. it's a naturally occurring massive obelisk but it also makes sense that if your worldview includes spirits and gods you would look at places that are very singular and outside of your experience as being either holy or mm-hmm. related to something because there isn't in your knowledge another place like this and then getting that place holy power like because of the view or the height and, like, if you look at Boise and you look at... Table Rock is frequently in pictures of Boise. Oh, yeah. Like, it's very much a distinguishing... You could see that cross is almost an easier thing to find than Bogus, the... the oh, especially since they upgraded it to LEDs. Right. I mean, it's pretty bright. It shines through clouds pretty far. You could easily see it from, like, where I live. And... Uh, see it from our backyard just fine. Right. And it's, it's interesting. Like, and I, it makes sense that the religion in charge would redefine that as theirs. Mm-hmm. It's just ridiculous to ignore the history of it. All right. Well, that wraps up the news. It's time to move on to feedback. Feedback. We got a comment on the Podbean app, which I didn't know was a thing, and I didn't know we were in. (laughs) Okay, well, okay. Apparently it it. is a thing, and we're in it. Uh, What's it it called? Podbean. Okay. They're a a podcasting host, and I didn't... Yeah, anyway. So they have an app, and we got a comment on there. Um, I don't know who it was from, but... Uh, the comment was regarding episode 275, which was Black Women v. Religion. Mm-hmm. Great episode. Doesn't get, to- doesn't get talked about enough. That's nice. That's very sweet. Yeah. And uh, you know, that was a, an amazing interview. I really enjoyed doing it. Who did you guys have on? Uh, we had v- Valerie Wade and Deanna Adams. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And uh, it was it was really cool. Uh Fortunately, I didn't ask any questions they thought were stupid. That's well, that's good. So that was that was definitely good. <laughs> and uh, we got a voicemail from Wyoming. Hi there, from Wyoming. Uh, I just wanted to give you guys a great shout out. I love your podcast. Um, it's nice to hear of some other atheists from the Mountain West. Uh, you know, we're pretty rare over here, so. I love hearing you guys. You guys are doing a great job. Your baby is adorable, and your puppies are cute. Have a great day. Bye. Ah, uh, thank you. Well, that's thank sweet. you. It is. We we definitely need to go to Wyoming. Mm-hmm. Well, we need to go to more than Wyoming than just Yellowstone. Yeah, we need to go to the rest of Wyoming. Yeah. Oh, maybe that should be uh, when we get the the mobile studio set up. Do you just travel the world? Maybe that should be one of our first travel routes. Like hit up uh, Sam in Idaho and a couple spots in Wyoming. Yeah, that could be neat. Definitely. Yeah. But, you know, uh, it, it is, uh, we aren't the only ones in the Mountain West. Um, you know, in, in Wyoming, there's Waiting for Wrath. Um, Utah's got a couple podcasts, uh, Godless Revolution and Utah Outcasts. Yeah, but atheists per person and atheists per square These mile are, is pretty low. It is, yeah. Yeah, like it's... Yeah. Population it, per square mile is, is low. <laughs> but I mean, even even when you measure like within the context of that we're still not a very large percentage but yeah. I, I mean that also goes back to my old argument that most people are functionally atheists they identify culturally as religious when they're not really religious people yeah it is yeah. definitely an outspoken minority on the right that pushes a lot of the hardline stuff and extremists hold the microphone so they, they tend to get overblown yeah and uh if you want to 
contact us, you can always email us at contactatheistnomads.com. Send us a message on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666, like our anonymous caller from Wyoming did. Or use the SpeakPipe link on the webpage at atheistnomads.com. Okay. We got a upgrading patron, George G. So Ooh. thank you, George. Um, if you want to support us, patreon.com slash atheistnomads. We appreciate the support. It covers our cost, it covers upgrades, and it helps make sure that we can keep doing the show. Good idea. So yes, please uh, give us the support you can. And we have a contest that will be ending November 17. So if you want to have a chance at winning a signed copy, signed by Chris Matheson of The Trouble with God, by Chris Matheson, um, one copy will go to a patron or person who donates to our microphone upgrades. Oh, yeah. The other copy will go to the person who gives us the most. The current amount to beat to get the copy for the most is uh, $75. I was a guest on Living After Faith, episode 93. Uh, I, it was my second time on that show. First time was seven years ago. Oh, wow. So a lot has changed. And so talk about, um, you know, catch up on, on the stuff we talked about then and mm. uh, continue on with, you know, how life's going now. So if you want to check that out, um, go to livingafterfaith.com, I think it is. And we are also launching a listener survey. Ooh. This has multiple reasons for it. One is we have never done a a listener survey, and it is helpful for us to know who's listening. Millions of people. We have no idea. Millions all over the world. We know numbers. We know places. That's it. So if we can find out more about you, there's demographic questions. There's some questions about what you think about the show. Um, the survey will also have the benefit of helping us open up a little better a revenue stream for the show, and that is advertising. Um, I have done a horrible job of it, and since uh, we lost our one sponsor a, about a year ago, um, haven't done a good job of getting new advertising and getting some better listener demographics. Let me phrase that. Getting some listener demographics <laughs> would help because advertisers want to know who's listening. So they know whether or not they Other want than to advertise. straight white men in their 30s. Yeah, well, that's 20s always, and 30s. It's always pretty predominant in atheist circles anyway. We're pretty... Uh, I want to I wanna see, though, if, if, if that's true of our show or if maybe we do manage to grab, because Dustin does make such an effort to include so many voices. Now, one thing that's been interesting is in the last you know year and, and several months, um, I made the goal of making it rare for me to be the, or make it rare for these people on the show to only be straight white men. It's true. Instead, it has been, the majority of the time, it's almost been rare that I'm not the only straight white male. That's all right. We're okay with that. We'll keep that. Yeah, I'm okay with that. You do a pretty good job of asking questions and uh, self-critiquing, which is all that we mostly ask for our straight white male friends is that you give a shit and try to do better. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's easier for me to be patient being another white guy, you know, yeah. because I'm still Venn diagram, mostly the same person. But uh, yeah, it is difficult. It's difficult out there, but also a thing that's been happening a lot in entertainment. So you're definitely on the, uh, you definitely keep a track of what's going on. So yeah, in the survey, we ask, what are we doing well? What can we do better? Um, it, it helps to know how many of our listeners are straight white men in their 30s like me, or how many are... Whatever anything you, you else, decide to label yourself to be honest, right? And uh, I, I put <laughs> in as fine. many options You're as you're a hipster in Portland who rejects all <laughs> labels. That's all right. Codification is yeah. a fundamental need of the human brain. Now, it's the one thing difficult. the one thing I don't ask is where you are because I already know that, right? No, okay, I don't know exactly don't know who's no, where, but, but I know right. where listen the downloads are coming from. Totally understandable, though. Like, yeah. it also, it does help keep track. Of like, you know, who's mm-hmm. listening, who's interested in what feedback they have. Feedback's cool. You can find the survey at atheistnomads.com slash survey. Mikey, what do you have to plug? Well, no, I have a show that has had happened by the time you're listening to this episode. It was really good, I'm sure, because I'm pretty funny. And uh, if, 
If you're in the Boise area, the next thing that I'm definitely uh, doing is uh, I produce the Gay as Fuck show, Gay AF, uh, the last Monday of every month at the Lucky Dog in downtown Boise, Idaho. I will be featuring at Liquid Laughs in downtown Boise in the first or second weekend of the year in January. All right. And then I've got, uh, yeah, and I'm doing the roast of 2018 at Woodland Empire Brewery. That's the show, another show I'm producing, where we and some of the funniest people in Boise will be roasting the year of 2018. And that's going to be a lot of fun and a bunch of other stuff. So that's going to be good. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun things. So if you're in the area, you can see me. If you're not in the area, follow me on everything. It's always my name, Mikey Pullman. All right. Mikey Pullman. Pullman. Lauren, thank you. You Kay. did awesome. You're great. Keep I, on the I show have a together. baby in my lap, sucking Who's on her fingers. Finally asleep. It's adorable. Super excited for you to have more time to participate in future years. Yes. And listeners, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Rocco. <laughs> <laughs> he was also asleep. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. She's so talkative <laughs> today. Oh, man. She's really excited to have this bottle right now. She's vocal.